Well, I'll tell you what, let's kick it off, shall we? Let me see if, uh... so let's get it started. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. There we go. Let me know when you can see it. There it goes. All right, well, welcome to everybody who's in person uh, and on YouTube. We're in webinar five in our series. Um, this is a little bit out of, out of sequence. We moved one up. We're probably gonna move some of the scheduling around for the, the next few weeks, but today's topic is uh, blockable and environmental impact, which is something that's near and dear to our hearts um, and is also something that we've been working very hard on uh, in a number of aspects uh, to build into everything that we're doing. Um, topically, the way we're gonna go through it is sort of looking at it in two big buckets. The one is, um, you know, how does development um, open the path to the massive environmental impact that, that we're projecting with our model and with our system? And then second, specifically around the manufacturing and operations um, and also getting into the incentives, which are, a key aspect of how the business model uh, enables, you know, ongoing performance improvement, ongoing environmental improvement. Um, and the claim is, you know, we think modular development is the biggest environmental impact opportunity in the world. And there's a number of reasons for that. But if you look at the size of the problem, the size of the issue, uh, the size of the potential impact, the the magnitude of the model that we're implementing, uh, it's a pretty, pretty uh, big deal. So uh, I'm Aaron Holman, I'm the co-CEO. Uh, this is my partner and co-CEO, Nelson Del Rio. Uh, Hello. And let's, let's start with looking at the, unless you have, do you have any intro comments, Nelson? I know you, you have a Maybe Nelson, you want to talk for a moment about your uh, your background uh, in climate and in the environment. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Happy to. Um, so I've actually been in climate since before people thought about it being a problem. Um, I hate to say, when I was growing up, I had a uh, a green peace emblem on the back of my backpack as a small kid because I thought about the climate. Um, I ended up um, becoming heavily involved with the University of Washington, uh, of course, because I went there after being a dropout, but. It's also uh, one of the best research institutes in the world when it comes to environment and, and um, certain types of science. Um, I am one of the four uh, founding co-members, uh, four members of the largest college of the environment in the world, the University of Washington College of the Environment. And um, I helped put that together because I believe that, number one, environment, of course, is going to be a big thing. And mankind had to learn to uh, live within its space and within its um, kind of capacities. But uh, more important to me was that science and business were never tied together right. So there was always a talk of, you know, there's a way to do it this way and it's going to be sustainable and isn't that wonderful. But when you went out and looked at the application of that scientific approach to sustainability, um, it turns out business found a way to tear it up. It's the process of creating the, the wealth. It's the process of, you know, um, paying for things to get done that that's kind of just blows everything out of the water. And scientists aren't trained to deal with that. Um, both environment people aren't, the advisors to it aren't. We don't have a kind of a profession anywhere in the world that really has, has solved the problem of letting humans kind of build these physical things in a way that works for the planet and for the people and can be done in a way that's kind of economical. So if um, Aaron ever can go out and say, hey, let's build every home at a million and a half dollar cost, every apartment. Uh, great, we can make it green, we can make it fully kind of passive and everything else. But guess what? All the rich people would be living in passive homes, the rest of people would have tents. So that's always it's been the problem. Which so is I did kind that of what's there. happening. I, yeah, it is what's happening. And, and the other thing I did is the World Bank um, has been involved in this for a long time, of course. And uh, a little over 10 years ago, uh, I was voted on to a World Bank panel to define sustainability for the world because they had a lot of mistakes and couldn't resolve it. So um, I was one of 21 people voted on that panel with some amazing people. And the report we, uh, that we authored um, was based upon the work that we have implemented here, actually, the same approach to things. And the real question we had for the world and, and achieving sustainability is how do you possibly drive um, incentives into the private industry to solve major problems without causing destruction of the human system and solving it? Um, it's, it's harder than you might think. So blockable is just, uh, again, a carrying forward of that uh, same theory. Um, that's the big picture stuff. 
So the, the thing to keep in mind as we go through the webinar is to sort of pay attention to how the incentives work and then also to pay attention to the relationship between cost and um, efficiency. So looking at the, the different mechanisms that we use in our model and uh, our engineering and our product, how they work together to create an incentive um, so that it's an ongoing and continuous improvement. And also because it's housing, there's, there's a necessary correlation between cost um, and impact. And so just keep an eye on those issues. Because if you look at the broader uh, picture, I mean, a lot of people over the last, I'd say, two to three years have started to really tune into how big um, of a player real estate and buildings are in the overall sort of climate issue. So the, you know, 40 plus percent of global energy use, um, you know, almost 40 percent of emissions. I mean, real estate overall as an industry is a massive contributor, uh, both to energy use and to emissions. Um, and then combine that with <clears throat> just the amount of waste that's created in the process for fairly predictable reasons. But, you know, we're, the way that we build, the way that projects are thought about, designed, conceived, engineered, and built uh, leads to a lot of waste. And in the U.S., the number is somewhere between 600 and 650 million tons of construction material waste on an annual basis. So these numbers are these numbers are massive. And if you think about the process of one-off builds, um, there's a significant percentage of materials that are sent from factories to construction sites that then just go directly into the garbage. So you know that you've got yeah, a pretty yeah. inefficient process when you're, when you've got, uh, when you're built, when you're sending, you know, when you're paying for and sending goods to a site to then convert them into landfill. Aaron, go, go back one picture. I want to make a point here as we look at this. If you look at the things flying in the air, this seems like a simple cartoon here, but if you think about it, the wood, the steel, the wires, the nails, the, the siding, um, every single one of those things has an unbelievable impact on the environment in sourcing. And imagine what it takes to drive it from all its different locations and transfer it and hold it. And so it, it's amazing to think that the, the footprint to create the thing that, that you're actually sending, and then the footprint you cause to ship it to these sites and manage it, move it, and then you go and throw it away. So it's, it's, it isn't just the thing that's in it. It's that carbon footprint of the, just the waste. It's unbelievable. So globally, um, you know, real estate assets consume 40% of the world's energy, 30% emissions of GHG, consume 40% of all raw materials, which is a massive number and then this is all in an industry that's valued at $50 trillion globally. So this is a massive economic, and it's an engine, an engine that drives a lot of economic activity that currently uh, is responsible for a lot of waste and a lot of emissions. Um, and so overall, it's an inefficient process that creates an undersupplied asset because at the same time as the process that we use to build new real estate, in particular, in our case, what we're most focused on is housing, is also massively undersupplied. So you have this, this twin problem where you have a very inefficient way of delivering something that is badly needed. So it's not like we're, we're talking about an industry that's very inefficient, but you know it, it'll go away over time because there's new technologies that are being implemented that are gonna change it. It's no longer gonna be a product that's needed. That's not the case. In this case, we're talking about housing, which is badly uh, undersupplied, 6.8, million units undersupplied across the country. That's the current undersupply. And then it's estimated well, that you know, just Aaron, for multifamily alone, by 2035, there will need to be 3.5 million units to keep up with growth. So you take those two numbers together and think about the, the amount of need. Yeah, I would add to that. This is probably the only product where you absolutely know there's demand. You know it's going to get bigger. You know it's going to sell for more. And yet you can't supply an answer to it. <laughs> See, I'm probably the only one in the world. Yep. Housing. And there's money. And there's money. So $246 billion invested into multifamily housing in the U.S. in 2022. So we view housing as an environmental issue. We know that it's not a, you can't just throw money at it. That's not, that's not the solution. So, you know, we end up usually here when we talk about 
okay, well, what's the problem? <laughs> so if you look at like, if you look at the, the problem, the way we see it, there's been a lot of folks who have taken approaches, uh, modular prefab, 3D printing, panelized systems, et cetera, to solve the construction side of the problem. And in our view, that's just not, never gonna really amount to much because of where those solutions sit in the overall hierarchy of development. And this is the chart that we keep coming back to because what this represents and ties to in terms of what we've been talking about is yes, it's an inefficient process. This in front of you right now is the inefficient process. This is the inefficient process that it takes to develop housing, all of these players. And this is to deliver one project. Every project, same set of steps, it's invented de novo, it's created as a one-off, it's built as a one-off, a bunch of stuff goes in the garbage. Government regulations will say what the performance needs to be, what the energy performance needs to be. But overall, this is not the process that's going to make a material change in efficiency. It's just, there's just no. You know, Aaron, I would say if you look at it, to be fair, it's highly efficient given what it was intended to do. So the fact that somebody could, as a general contractor, run that giant mess and never get anything done, and you have change orders and delays and a whole lot of waste, that's, you know, is what it is, that's construction. Um, but the fact that they can actually get it done is pretty efficient in a way. It's not a way to solve the problem, but they managed to solve it and actually build something. It so, was a way to solve a problem in history. <laughs> that's correct. Yeah. yeah. So the way we look at it is, you know, how do we take, and the first part of this presentation is really setting the stage around the development problem because it's a, it's a, it's a, it's vital, right? So understanding manufacturing, understanding operations, understanding efficiency, understanding scale, understanding how these things get driven down over time. They're all a function of development. They're all a function of a development process that leverages standardization, leverages repeatability, leverages efficiencies to create the right alignment of incentives so that the development process can scale. Right, which is ultimately the answer to how do you how do you address uh, waste? How do you address GHG? How do you address VMT? How do you address all of these issues from a metric perspective? How do you really address them at scale? And the answer is to disrupt development. So these are this is how we view the development process. And then I'll show a quick video because it's it's crucial to understanding what standardization means to us and thinking about the process of housing development using um, a standardized building system, standardized engineering, and a standardized manufacturing process that allows us to build um, an asset class that's very badly needed, very undersupplied in the market, using manufacturing rather than using construction, and using a repeatable process that we call modular development. So modular development is the vertically integrated process whereby we develop housing using our own internally engineered system that's manufactured uh, and that greatly reduces the cost, time, and waste of building housing while creating huge amount of upside and profits on the market rate side, but also opportunity and lower cost and, and affordability on the not-for-profit side. Yeah. So I, I would add something to that, which is, it's not obvious if you listen to another modular Kind of what quote unquote developer because modular developers aren't actually modular developers or developers who utilize a modular product and that's a very different thing um they're going to say the same thing you'll think you're here the same things the fact is you have to come up with a product that is variable and applicable to any site without modifying the underlying system that is a manufactured product and there is not a company in america today that has a standardized system that's capable of full flexibility across every asset type in any physical situation. So the hard part with real estate is, is that thing that's going down right there has to go down on something that may have an earthquake fault under it. It could have bad soils. It could have a water table. Um, it has to look different because it's in different types of neighborhoods. Your, your uh, living spaces, as you'll see when this comes together and opens up, the living spaces are going to vary all the time. And if you look at that the columns of uh, the patio to that first column line, um, and, and kind of halfway past halfway, that can be a big open living space for us. And we can do that without changing our engineering, changing our manufacturing, changing anything. So it's having unbelievable stability and the ability to change that interior and to, uh, to be flexible with any use in any location that um, is unique. And I know it sounds simple, but if you've ever designed and built something, you'll understand that um, it's not so simple to get it uh, through when you have earthquakes underneath the building. So the, the, the building, 
the the end to end process is the result of and, and this all has you know a payoff so this is all leading to the environmental side of it the efficiency side of it how do we think about the ability to create environmental impact at scale but it's all a function of you know the work that we've done to date six years a lot of investment in engineering but all of that engineering and investment was done in light of wanting to really push the envelope when it comes to creating uh, environmental impact and so a lot of that is a function of being able to build something that's needed in the marketplace, which for us is looking at these different asset classes of multifamily and thinking about the application of our building system into different sizes, different formats, different communities, different architectural considerations, different designs, different aesthetics, different contexts. I mean, having a building system that has the ability to meet the market uh, pretty much anywhere that we want to build is a key. It's fundamental to then being able to create the types of efficiencies that we want to create. They're very closely related. So looking at how that building system gets implemented, again, as we, all of this, if you think about the, the process that we have here when considering things like construction material waste or operating efficiency or uh, emissions, um, we're starting from a position where we know our building, we know the components, we know all the parts. So in a manufacturing process, particularly a just-in-time manufacturing process, there's very little waste. And so when we're creating our schematics and our massing for a building, we're not doing it as a design exercise. It's an exercise of application using an existing set of engineering, an existing set of components and materials so that when we put a building in place and we say, okay, this is the building that we want to build. We understand the features, we understand the architectural elements, but when we go to manufacture this building, uh, it's precise. And so we're ordering the specific sets of materials that are needed and the manufacturing process abhors waste. And so pushing, pushing a building through a manufacturing process, when we get into the, the numbers, which are later in the presentation, that single act being able to move the, the creation of a building like this that's needed in the market that has the type of value that it has that can be underwritten the way it can be underwritten that can meet regulatory code and that is desired by renters desired by the market being able to shift that process from a construction process into a manufacturing process opens the door to an entirely different scale of efficiency and an entirely different set of metrics. So the, the core of all that setup is to say that modular development enables manufacturing. You can't just get manufacturing using the process that we showed you before because that's not the way that process works, but our process does. So then looking at what we've done to, to know what we're talking about, <laughs> part of it is, you know, this was our second factory. And this is what, you know, the manufacturing early, early, early stage, we call it prototyping, looks like um, in, the, in, in our building setting. So looking at the, this is a project we built in Auburn. This is the, uh, uh, the Phoenix Rising project. And I'll get to why it's important in a moment. But, you know, looking at the pre precise application of uh, non-structural steel, coal roll form steel, looking at different types of materials, the repeatability ability. I mean, you could shoot a laser through a penetration in one of these buildings and it would go the full length of the factory because they're so precisely on the factory floor. These buildings were, were, were truly assembled. They were not constructed. And the result of that, that building set is something that on site, um, meets all the necessary code was approved by the city approved by the state and operates very efficiently and, and this ties into a lot of work that we were doing with the uh, national renewable energy lab which we'll get to in a moment but if you think about this on a small scale so this was a 12 unit uh building that was engineered to three-story engineering but we implemented it as a as a single story but it's permanent high quality long-term useful life uh beautiful buildings uh that you know, if you look at them, because we, we controlled the process, they're very efficient to operate. So these are 60% lower cost to heat and cool. The buildings are all electric. Uh, they're indoor air plus. They're silent. Uh, they're gorgeous. Thinking about this as a small scale implementation of what then turns into larger buildings like this. So looking at the pieces that we're putting together, how do we, how do we stand up a system that regardless of the size of the project, meets the same sort of set of set of requirements. So this was these were some of the features that came out of the uh, the Phoenix Rising project that we're very proud of. And then I can get into sort of some of the details working with the National Renewable Energy Lab. We started looking at okay, how do we how do we maximize the efficiency 
um, of these builds? How do we make sure that the building envelope, that core block performance on a block by block basis, uh, that was kind of the exercise in this project was to create a really efficient envelope that we could repeat and implement for different scale projects, different size projects, different floor plans, um, et cetera. And that was the, the genesis of the partnership that we had with uh, NREL. So if you look at a lot of what the what the NREL and I'll, I'll as a follow up to this, I'll send around a copy of the NREL technical report, which is essentially a, a, a report that spanned our sort of two year partnership where they looked at our phased implementation and ramp up of manufacturing over time uh, and then looked at the projected impact from an environmental and cost perspective. And this is one really key attribute here, which is the cost reduction and the environmental impact go hand in hand. Because of the process performed, because of the incentive alignment, you get both. And so it's not a function of like the traditional trade-off, if you look at the traditional uh, development process, if you want higher performance, it's higher cost. And so the reason the reason that uh, Wells Fargo financed the uh, the IN2 program, which is what we participated in with the National Renewable Energy Lab, was they saw, particularly in California, what a huge issue this was. Because you have two issues, and, and unless unless you figure out fundamentally different models for implementation, they're going to take you in opposite directions. The one is there's a a, a need for more efficient builds that have less put less stress on the energy grid and are more efficient to operate. And at the same time, there's a, a massive need for affordable housing. So unless you put those two ideas together, when you're thinking about the disruptive models that are out there, um, you won't be able, one will take you in a direction that takes you totally away from the other. And so if you just take a regulatory approach and say, well, all the buildings are gonna have to meet much higher regulatory standards because of the needs for the grid or the needs for uh, you know, emissions or reduced climate impact, if you just put those requirements on the current industry, that just leads to higher costs, like Nelson was mentioning. If you just say everything needs to be a passive house, we can solve that. You can figure that out. It's just that you know no one's going to be able, very fewer people are going to be able to afford that solution. So this was the happy crew. This is during COVID. So this building uh, behind them. Uh, has been all over the place. So this building behind them has been, this was, uh, we had a, a partner event with Kaiser Permanente down in San Francisco during the big, some of the biggest fires in California history. And so inside that block was the cleanest air anywhere in San Francisco during that event. Then it was trucked up to the Microsoft campus where Bill Gates sat inside and asked the question, why hasn't technology been able to drive down the cost curve of housing? Then it was at our office in Seattle for a while while we did uh, tours and brought in different officials. Then it was used as a, uh, a quarantine unit for uh, COVID because it was wheelchair accessible. And so the state uh, borrowed it from us for a while and put it into a quarantine location. And then we trucked it over to the National Renewable Energy Lab where they use it as a baseline to test um, energy efficient products, materials, components, uh, all sorts of different things because it's a it's a baseline where they understand the building performance and they use it to to test different materials. So this building has been craned, I think, ten times, um, and we know its performance. This block, this base unit, um, was one of the first builds that we did before we did the multi-unit project. But it it sort of taught us a lot about you know uh, how we can scale the process and what it means to move from low low volume pre-production uh, sort of assembly into what we call the industrialized construction phase, which is the next phase for us as we're doing fairly manual builds, and then into manufacturing where all kinds of crazy things happen as you sort of tap into the manufacturing learning effects. So getting into, um, Nelson, anything you want to you want to comment on the on the stuff in, in, um, in Auburn no, I mean, or? No, you know what, I, I would just say that, um... This all seems obvious. I'm sure people listen to the videos and go, oh, yeah, it's got to be simple. Everybody's doing it. Um, it's hard to come up with a structure that, number one, is applicable anywhere, that satisfies the code requirements, not only in you know, Nevada or, or somewhere else, or, but also in Washington State and California State. Um, there are different uh, structural requirements. There are different ADA requirements. There's different electrical requirements. Uh, there's different gas requirements. So, you know, California, some cities have outlawed. Um, the use of gas, if I change the law now, everything's all electric, which is fine. We've always planned for that. Um, 
But as you go through and start um, learning all these things, you're not only trying to solve for the manufacturing problem, you're solving for the, the kind of site-specific code-related problems. And, and then on top of all that, you have to solve kind of how do you possibly ever get this to scale, make it quick enough and kind of inexpensive enough to manufacture, make it um, kind of affordable. And as you mentioned a minute ago, it, it's easy to get to a, a really high cost, highly efficient home. And I think, Aaron, if the answer were in technology, Bill Gates or Bezos or someone else would own a company that owned all housing in the country because they could solve it with technology. It's not a technological problem. It's a development problem. And that's why nobody's done it. Yep. And if you get the, but if you get the baseline and all of this is a setup, essentially, all of this is, is a setup to the big question, which is how do you really get to manufacturing? And I'll, I'll dial us back really quickly to a couple of points just to, to emphasize it. You can't get to manufacturing anywhere here. You can manufacture walls, you can manufacture windows, you can manufacture doors, you can manufacture any of the components that go into a build, but you cannot take the, the almost the entire site build and move it into a factory because all these projects are designed, thought of, implemented and developed as one-offs. So that's not the solution. You also can't get to manufacturing if you think that you're gonna leap directly from site building to automation and robotics. There's just too much to it. And so the issue is like, if you look at any other, and this was, this was the path that we took, where you look at any other industry and they're asking the question, you know, look at solar panels or look at, you know, rockets or look at any, any industry that's kind of gone from early stage prototyping into mass production. There's a phase, it takes time. And so the issue is it, it takes time to get through short run prototyping to stabilize engineering, stabilize assembly sequences, stabilize equipment, stabilize the flow of data to the point where you can really leverage the advantages of manufacturing. And so it's not, it's not a quick uh, ramp up. You have to go through these phases. There's no shortcuts. You have to be able to demonstrate these different phases of growth. But when you get there, there's massive payoff. And so the, the, the approach that we've been taking is not to shortcut any of these, to maintain control over the process, to always treat it as a development problem, to understand how the money gets made so that we can incentivize everything across the board, understand it's also an affordability issue, so it's a split market solution, solve all of that while getting to real manufacturing. Because if you do, that's where a lot of the NREL data starts to, starts to really open eyes as to what the potential can look like. And again, I wanna call your attention to both sides of the issue because they're very closely related. If you look at cost reduction and you look at GHG reduction, they're both functions of efficiency and functions of waste. And so how do you reduce and simplify and move what was traditionally a construction process into a manufacturing process and leverage all of the benefits of doing that? So these are you know, some detailed uh, charts, but what this essentially shows is that you know, for us, and, and our bar was not to build cheap, low performing, you know, not environmentally efficient um, housing. The, the goal and all these numbers are around building net zero energy um, housing. And so the costs are born into that, which are what are the costs to actually implement NZE. This is a really critical uh, chart because what this shows essentially is that there's no point in investing in automation until you've reached a, a level of stability and a level of repeatability in the build. The number that they point out is about a thousand units. I could be right or wrong, but it's somewhere in line with kind of how we're how we're ramping up um, our development activity. Because there's no point. You actually, it's very inefficient, very costly. You can ask a number of factories across the U.S., and they'll tell you this, which is if you invest in automation, you invest in robotics before you're ready. You're just wasting money and you're wasting time, and it's a good way to sink a factory. And so, looking at some of the critical mass, I mean, these are well, the, the key is these are well studied subjects and you can look at other industries and see from a manufacturing perspective, when did the benefits kick in? So the way that we broke this apart was to say, well, the first phase of the company, which we've gone through is that initial uh, pre-build product development. So what is the envelope? What is the assembly? What are the materials? What are we, what are we building this with? What, what asset class are we going after? How long is, you know, how big do these factories need to be? What's the labor model? What's the supply chain model? What's the logistics model? We have to figure all of these things out, which we've done in the first stages of the company, which is this sort of initial phase. And then that builds you into this phase that we're in now, which is the industrialized construction phase. So larger volume, single plant, 
right? So building out of a single plant, but building for more of a repeatable pipeline, but it's still fairly manual. It's still a fairly manual process. It's not robotics. It's not automation. It's not time for those things yet. You're stabilizing processes. And then you're building a certain volume out of there as you, as you stabilize it all. And as you do, then you get to tap into the learning effects. You get to tap into the S curve. And this is where the real payoff hits is you start to get into the advanced manufacturing phase. If you look at these, these bars here and you look at the efficiency that you start to hit, it's when, you've, it's when you've frozen design, it's when you've frozen the assembly process, when you've validated the sequences, when you know your cycle times, when everything moving through is happening in the same way, project after project after project, you tap into a level of learning effects that change the entire housing development industry forever. Aaron, let me add something. I think that if, if you're not familiar with the industry and you're looking at this, you'd say, well, you know, what about a modular company that's been in existence for a decade or two decades? And it really goes to what, what product is being built. So if you're serving developers and contractors and architects, then you're building the thing that they need to build and you haven't stabilized a system that is kind of land agnostic, which means you can put it anywhere and not have to change your engineering. They have um, what we call shear wall and bracing and other things that they have to deal with because of earthquake and just the structural thing. Um, so it, while it, it's it's kind of embedded in this whole conversation, the fact is it's creating a product that is ungodly flexible and manufacturable at scale without having to use an architect and engineer every time you apply it to a site. And that's what no one has gotten to. And to make that leap, you actually have to build it, work through the process, find your limitations, Figure out what you know, why, um, and how could you get rid of that shear wall, and and then what does it do to the rest of the build, and then how do you assemble it? What does it do to manufacturing? That's what we've gotten through um, that no one else has. Uh, I think that um, eventually the only way the housing um, kind of dilemma that we all live in is going to be solved will be if the whole industry follows that. Because Aaron, it doesn't matter how big we are, um, we could never solve the housing dilemma on our own. And this has to be learned by the entire industry, which is also key to how we're approaching this i mean we want you know we want the the world to evolve to this approach because there's such a, a massive need and so there's not you know like nelson was mentioning that if we're if we're let's let's just use california as a singular example if california is three million units short of housing right and you look at some of the numbers like the assumptions that are baked into here so if if this entire study right which shows massive um, efficiency and huge, like groundbreaking uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions and construction material waste and all these numbers. It's based on us building 10,000 units by 2030, right? So let's say, let's say we're at a steady state where a factory is, is putting out, you know, four or 5,000, you know, apartments on a yearly basis. Let's say more, let's say that's just an, an annual production volume, huge, investment right huge investment returns because the the amount of money you're creating by building four to five thousand apartments in a market where you're building them at lower cost the amount of the amount of wealth that you're generating is huge but in terms of the number it's nothing right so relative to a three million dollar three million unit shortfall of housing you know you can do the math how many how many factories would be needed to even supply five percent ten percent of that market Right, you can't, you can't, there's there's so much housing production that's needed. Well, and Aaron, let me point something out on that too. The problem with the industry is to solve housing, everyone has to learn to disrupt development. I mean, every, the whole industry has to change. Um, what that requires though, are the people who are making money from the existing structure, the architects, the engineers, the developers, the contractors, everybody who make their living from the current structure would have to be disrupted. So it's in their best interest not to see that happen. So it, it really is a very odd thing that we're trying to solve housing and everybody's working to solve housing, but they really don't want to solve housing. That would be bad. Right. Um, and which is, you know, we should have a webinar on, you know, I don't know, uh, seven, seven dimensional concepts on, on housing or something. But yeah. um, so what all this leads into and what we'll close with is the incentives. Right. So like, what are the incentives to do this? None of this works. And you'll see this, you'll see this now and into the next year. There'll, there's already, it's already started. There'll be a bunch of uh, factory failures because of the market conditions, because of interest rates, because of the, the fact that development projects have dried up, has left factories that 
sit in service of the development process or the general contractor process um, with far too little work to do or not able to uh, price their work at a level that's going to allow them to keep the lights on. So there's a lot of factories that are right now, okay, how do we keep the lights on? Because of the incentive structure. So if you're thinking that you want to build this, this volume, if you're selling this into an industry where the margins are already sort of accounted for, everything's sort of spoken for already, you know, the question is, well, you know, what's going to happen when you get to 10,000? And what's happened repeatedly in the industry is, you know, initially when you're building projects, you know, people will build them at a loss or they'll build them, you know, taking all the risk or they'll, they'll, they'll do those types of things just to get a foothold and to get some projects underway with the assumption that when they get to volume, the margins are going to be good. The margins are going to be better. They're going to be able to achieve, you know, really good margins. Uh, but then in the end, they don't control them. And so what happens is the, the margins get sort of eked away. Uh, and then you end up with a business that's not able to really deliver substantial margins that investors require. So this number here is really important because what, what we show is in our model, as this number goes up, our margins go way up because we're reducing cost, and because we, we take out the benefits of cost reduction in the economics of our company. So our company does better as our costs go down, which is key. Well, and stay on that for a second. So the really important point here is that unlike any other market, and, and there, there's you know, a pair of Nike is a great shoe. It's been around for a long time and, and their sales volume goes up and down. They got competitors and that's great, but people always work tennis shoes. Housing and real estate is one of those things that is absolutely cyclical. It always has been and it always will be. Interest rates move up and down, and demand changes, environments change, things happen in the world that cause a push on the um, supply chain, and then all of a sudden prices go up, people can't afford it. So there's been you know cycle after cycle in real estate. So the modular business as a whole over decades has been designed to fail in every cycle. It has to. If if their average margin is 10%, which is what McKinsey reports the, a, a successful company can get to if it works really hard, then what happens when one of the inevitable cycles comes along and kicks their tail? It's over. It cannot survive. The burden is too heavy because it takes a large fixed cost to and, and manufacture something. Just like what would happen if you uh, were forward in making cars and you said, by the way, every time rates go up, we stop selling cars. Well, that'd be the end of Ford. It couldn't exist anymore. So the business model adopted, which comes from the, the stuff I mentioned earlier, but I've done this in other areas. Um, in, instead of looking at a commodity creation, which, which then ties to the cycles of cash and real estate, you look at wealth creation. So if you become highly efficient at wealth creation, you can do it faster, do it cheaper. Then as you head into those cycles, when dirt gets cheaper and things get tighter, when costs go up, you're able to build into that cycle and take advantage of the lower input costs because of the, of the competition being squeezed away. So it's, instead of serving an industry that strives just to survive and starts kind of shedding off weight and just making it through the other end, you become the thing that eats up the industry as soon every time it turns down. So looking at incentives, this is sort of, you know, if you think, think in, in the most simplistic terms, um, as as we reduce costs, and remember the, the relationship between cost reduction um, and performance and efficiency. So as we reduce costs, uh, we make more money on the market rate side, right? So that, that's a, a key attribute of this, which is because of this structure. And Nelson, maybe you want to kind of walk through sort of how it, yeah. how it does that. But the, the, the ability to, to produce and develop housing at a lower cost basis is uh, is incentivized throughout the structure. Yeah, so the key to the structure is that if the modular development company is extracting all the wealth in the back end out of the project that it creates, then it has every incentive to minimize the tax burden, minimize, minimize the cost burden, speed up the process, minimize the kind of conflicts between all the things getting done on site, um, so the way to do that is to create this opco prop code structure. On one side, you've got a manufacturing side that that services the development side and says, well, we can build anything, anywhere, any way you want, any product type, any class of asset from three fifty a foot to six dollars a foot, um, with balconies overlooking the ocean to somewhere where it's it's, it's you know lower cost and and uh, more affordable. 
So with that factor being highly stable, being able to satisfy any need, it gives certainty to the Propco side as to what its costs are. So when the Propco side is out looking for dirt, it knows exactly what it's going to cost. It knows that it can get through the pre-development stage much, much faster at a much lower cost. Um, and then you use that Propco side to grow the, the asset creation business uh, with traditional um, finance tools. So you can use traditional equity participations and then, then move off into what we call mezzanine financing to reduce your equity needs and move it into a quasi debt. Um, and as you get uh, low enough costs and fast enough, uh, the point is to get rid of the need for outside equity. So what ends up happening is you build, after you build a property, then you go out in the market and you get it refinanced, not at what it costs you because while your construction loan is based upon what you're spending on the project, when you go out and get refinanced, it's based upon the value you created. So the goal is to create a lot of value and refinance out and then use those proceeds um, and leverage up to the next one. Refinance proceeds are not taxed. So we have this vertically integrated LLP structure that lets us build and, and keep putting that money back into the projects without leveraging against the company, without leveraging and cross collateralizing different properties. Each one is standalone. It's just that it keeps feeding the machine as it grows. The, the less expensive it becomes, the more money you make, the more money you make, the more you can build. It's a perpetual cash cycle. And that gets you to the big payoff, which is, okay, well, what are the impacts? So if you're able to, and this, this is all out of the, uh, the NREL technical report, you can Google it. If you Google uh, blockable NREL technical report, uh, you'll see the full, the full treatment. It's a peer-reviewed study. It's very, very thorough, uh, very well documented, uh, and very well founded. It's, it's based on studying other industries that have all experienced this type of ramp up, which has just never been conceived before in housing, which basically says, if you're going to manufacture a repeatable product, you have to go through these phases and it, you can swap industrialized construction essentially for short run prototyping. And so it's just not something that there's, there's, it's not something the industry's ever done. It's never taken, it's never had a building system that has the level of sophistication, standardization, manufacturability, broad applicability, land agnostic nature. It's, nobody's ever created a building system like that from the beginning to create development wealth that was designed from the start to be manufactured. But in order to manufacture it, we have to go through these phases. We go through these phases, then we tap into the S-curve. We tap into the learning effects of manufacturing, which again are well-documented and well-established. If you can get to those, then you're looking at really, really, really massive numbers. And these are compared to business as usual, uh, wood multifamily construction development uh, in the US. And then looking at numbers like we can reduce, and this is us building 10,000 units by the end of the decade. Compared to business as usual, wood frame construction, we would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 60%. We'd reduce construction material waste by 91%. Vehicle miles traveled because we're building in a plant instead of sending folks to different sites by 67% and cost reduction of 45%. These are, these are the numbers. I mean, this if you want to forever change the way housing is developed and turn it into a scalable, um, enterprise that incentivizes continuous improvement, cost reduction, efficiency, lower emissions, lower waste. I mean, this is the map it's right here. So this was our initial phase was getting to the point where we've essentially exited the pre-build product development phase. And now we're into the industrialized construction phase, which assumes a single plant, large plant where we build repeatable projects, which we're lining those projects up right now. Um, that then takes us into the ability to essentially take a factory and then repeat it for different markets uh, to develop into different markets and to scale. You know, Aaron, I have to say, and I hate to be jaded about things, but I've been in the environmental space for decades and it never fails. Um, ESG, there's so much greenwashing going on, it's unbelievable. And people investing in the space really don't want to see it that green because if they did, they'd have to ask themselves, is the thing that I'm investing in, in the end, causing the reductions that we're talking about? And, you know, they're not asking, you know, if, if I fix HVAC systems, will I now change the world? Well, no, because the way the building was built was wrong. You know, the way the building's operating was wrong. And yeah, I got one piece of it um, green, but that doesn't matter because the people who built the HVAC systems have made a bunch of money and they call themselves green. So I would say that our approach is a little bit different. We're looking at it and saying, how could you possibly put all this science and, and engineering together and come up with a solution 
uh, for the environment. Not one that's being washed, not one that we say we're going to change the world with, but one that actually is doable. And so that, that's that's what makes us very different, I think, and that annual report shows that the impact in the end. Yep. Well, with that, I think we're gonna we're gonna wrap up. Um, we're gonna we're gonna close out the the webinar, but uh, Nelson's got uh, hot news coming in on the on the on the news table there. So I uh, want to thank everybody for joining. Uh, we'll have more of these coming up. We'll update the schedule. We'll be posting this to YouTube. Uh, and thank you very much for your time. Uh, we appreciate it and always love talking about this subject. So thank you and have a lovely day. Bye. Bye. Until next time. Bye-bye.